So the NFL released the 2020 schedules for the league, and as you can imagine, everybody's opining and talking about what they see, predicting wins and losses in games that won't happen for four, five, six, seven damn months down the road like we can possibly even begin to imagine what could possibly unfold during the course of a season. People giving their predictions on records in large parts based off of that fallacy and so on and so forth. But hey, it is fun to have this discussion. It is fun to talk about these things. Which brings me to our Chicago Bears. The Bears. Now, let me be clear here. People can think whatever they want. Because the reality is, we don't know. We just don't know. Like, you can have a formulated opinion and think, the Bears are going to win the Super Bowl. The Bears are going to be a 10-win team. The Bears are going to go 8-8, eight eight, or 6-10, and 10, or they'll end up with the number one overall pick. The reality is, is we don't know. And any of those options are certainly possibilities. Now, possibility versus likely or probability, different conversation. But if you think about it, last year, the 49ers coming off of 2018 had the second overall pick in the draft, and they ended up in the Super Bowl. Who knows? Who absolutely knows what's going to happen? So... It won't be surprising to see, and I've already seen it, in terms of the Bears, a wide varying amount of opinions. But the purpose of this conversation for me is more to kind of like pressure test or level set or provide a bit of a wet blanket or a reality check to some of those Bears fans that I see having big hopes and aspirations for this 2020 season. Talk about 10 wins, talking about 11 wins, talking about winning the division, talking about this, and talking about all of that. You know, yes, granted, I will admit, I don't know what's going to happen. Neither do you. But just kind of looking at the evidence, I'm just wondering where Bears fans are coming up with this notion that this team is going to be markedly, dramatically better in 2020 compared to 2019. And if you want to start talking about individual schedules or things like that or who they play and when, I'm not paying attention to that right now. And I don't necessarily know if that is the right approach. You should be able to look at a team, their strengths, their weaknesses, like how strong are their strengths, how weak are their weaknesses, and use that as a better judge in terms of overall thoughts of record then maybe you look at the schedule to kind of figure out how that piece is together and if that kind of aligns with the thought process. But the thought process should come on a whole more holistic level in terms of here's what I envision for this team in terms of style of play, in terms of strengths, weaknesses, da, 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 da. You know, and you look at this, and I got to be honest, like, outside of wanting, hoping, and wishing, like, what real fact-based evidence do you have to support the notion that the Chicago Bears would be dramatically better in 2020? What do you have? Hope? Wish? Imagine? Now again, that's not saying that they couldn't. So don't come back to me in January if the Bears win 10 games and make the playoffs and be like, oh, you were wrong. That's not the point of this. The point of this is to talk about what are fans really basing this on? Because I'm just not seeing it. Like, first and most notably, people are going to say, well, Trubisky had a terrible year in 2019, and now they bring in Foles, and he's going to be an upgrade. Well, number one, that's not saying much. Number two, this is the same Nick Foles that the organization that just overpaid him a year before to make a statement that he was their guy in the Jacksonville Jaguars with the general manager who is still there in the fold, mind you, by the way, was so pleased with what they got out of him after one season that they traded him away because he lost his job to a sixth-round kid from a Mike Leach air raid system in Gardner Minshew. But you think Nick Foles, because of a couple of good games in the playoffs a couple of seasons ago, is going to represent such a significant seismic shift in the play at the quarterback position? Based on what? 
You're going to mention that great 2013 season he had with the 28 touchdowns, 200 receptions, or whatever the hell it was. It was 2013 under Chip Kelly! That's when people thought Chip Kelly was going to be a really good head of hell head coach. That's how dated that thought process and philosophy is. You think all of a sudden Nick Foles is going to come in and just set the world on fire or not suck as bad and then leave it to the mediocrity of the midway of the Bears fans' mindset thanks to the McCaskey family and their years and years of working to significantly and dramatically lower the bar that being average at the quarterback position is good enough. No, it's not. It's just that's the best you can expect out of a crappy organization like that one. But you look at it. So many key areas. I don't see where the upgrades or changes in personnel would indicate a dramatic improvement for this team. Running back. Sure, you'll have Tariq Cohen on a contract year, so maybe he'll play better. David Montgomery will be coming into year two. But if the offensive line in front of him can't block, in front of them can't block, and Matt Nagy can't figure out how to better utilize and consistently utilize his running game, then what will it matter? Wide receiver certainly is a strength of the team and a strength of the offense, and I think we'll see that manifest in 2020. But again, that's going to be somewhat contingent on how much they improve based off of what you might get out of a Foles versus a Trubisky. Or if and when the eventual Foles injury happens, what do you get out of Trubisky? And when you're in that place, is that a place you really want to be in? You look at tight end. Jimmy Graham's a name, but how much does Jimmy Graham have, really have left in the tank? A 13-win Packers team that could have re-signed him if they wanted to took a pass on him. But the Bears think he's going to be so much better than what they got out of tight end in 2019. Yeah. If he gives you a little bit of production, maybe he is better, but how much better is he really? The offensive line didn't add any notable personnel, and if you're going to tell me, well, coaching will fix it, well, coaching was supposed to fix it before, and it didn't fix it before. So what the hell now all of a sudden would make it so dramatically different? Scheme and philosophy are one thing, but at some point in time, the Jimmys and Joes matter just as much, if not more, than the X's and O's, and the Jimmys and Joes have not gotten any better on that offensive line. Like, what are we talking about here? And you look at the defense. Well, Akeem Hicks was out a good portion of the season last year, so he'll be back healthy. Well, you hope. You hope. And even if he is, what's to say that other guys on that defense don't end up with injuries and missing some, or if not, if not significant time? Like, at some point in time, the injury bug's going to have to bite this team a little bit more than it has the past couple of years. And even if you want to sit there and say, well, Akeem Hicks went down, it was such a dramatic difference in that defense in 2019, then that points to the fact that there were more problems than just Akeem Hicks missing on that defense for the vast majority of 2019. And you go into the linebacker core, sure, you bring in a Robert Quinn, you pay him big money, you'd certainly expect him to be an upgrade over Leonard Floyd, but how much of an upgrade is he going to be where previously he had kind of struggled in a 3-4? He goes to Dallas, plays in a 4-3, has a nice season in a contract year. Like, how confident are you in that, really? And you look at the inside linebacking group. You, know, you brought back Danny Trevathan. When the eventual Trevathan injury happens, like, what does the depth situation look like behind them? Are you counting on Roquan for 16 games? You, you get what I'm saying? Like, and even when you look at the secondary, sure, Prince of Mukamura wasn't the same in 2019. He's gone. But you're talking about Kyle Fuller, who's good, and then playing a second-round rookie in Jalen Johnson next to him, opposite side. That kid's going to get picked on a lot. Hopefully he cut, steps up to the challenge. But again, that's hope. We just don't know. And a lot of times it takes rookies the time to figure that out. And you look at safety, you know, Eddie Jackson, the way he was utilizing that Pagano system in 2019 was vastly different to 2018 and took him away from what was his biggest strength, which is his ability to make plays on the ball. You know, sure, you bring in a Tayshawn Gibson, maybe you think he's an upgrade to HaHa -Ha Clinton Dix, but how much of a, of a significant upgrade is that really? Like, you just look at it and you say a defense that you've had a couple of changes in personnel, but hasn't been dramatic changes and upgrades and improvements to personnel? I certainly don't think so. You have less depth on the defensive side of the ball at all levels, which that certainly holds true. For a defense that took a step back in 2019, 
you know, who's to say that this defense doesn't take a step back again in 2020? And if you're going to sit there and say, well, they'll bounce back because of... Where in the recent Bears history do you have any indication that this organization has shown you the ability to bounce back from a down season? Where? 2018 was successful. Division win. Home playoff game. Next year, miss the playoffs. Their history bears out that they will miss the playoffs again. Even with the expansion to seven teams at each conference. I, I don't get it. Like, if you're telling me that they were playing an incredibly soft schedule, that's one thing. I don't know if you could say their schedule's incredibly soft. If you want to say, well, Green Bay and Minnesota got worse, maybe, maybe. But Green Bay still has Aaron Rodgers. The Vikings have, you know, still some nice pieces on the team overall, and they still have Kirk Cousins. Even Detroit, assuming he's back and he's healthy, they have Matthew Stafford. Like, if you look at Nick Foles, if all things go according to plan for these other teams, the Bears will still be in a position where they have the worst quarterback in the division. The worst quarterback in the division. I'd rather have the best quarterback in the division than the best defense in the division. You know, but I don't think like a lot of other Bears fans. Just saying. Like, even if you want to believe that Green Bay takes a step back, they were still a 13-win team last year. But they feature Hall of Fame quarterback who's probably going to be really pissed that the team spent a first-round pick on Jordan Love. So even if they take a step back, that still could potentially mean a 10- or 11-win team. And you look at the Vikings, like for Bears fans talking about, well, they maybe take a step back and they trade away Diggs and they lose some other guys. Um, you know, who do you have more confidence in as a head coach, Mike Zimmer or Matt Nagy? And put your bias aside for a second. You know, the body of work indicates that Zimmer's a better head coach than Matt Nagy is. They have a better quarterback. They have a better running game. And the Bears' defense is not that much significantly better than the Vikings. And even if you want to go with Detroit, like Detroit had a bad year and things went sideways quickly, especially when Stafford went down. Let's assume Stafford comes back and he is healthy. You know, even though you would think, well, Matt Patricia's a fool and a clown and should have already been fired, but he's been given year three for reasons unbeknownst to anybody with a brain. You can also look at it and say, this is also the type of situation, you know, they drafted DeAndre Swift, they draft Okuda on the defensive side of the ball, you know, even though they get rid of Darius Slay. You look at this team and you say, okay, this is exactly the type of team that has no expectations that nobody believes in would be the type of dumb team that makes a dumb run at 10 or 11 wins and win in the division. Like if the Bears had made significant signature marquee moves in the offseason, that you could really point to and say, man, these are dramatic upgrades and improvements. That's one thing. But I'm here to tell you, Nick Foles and Robert Quinn ain't it. And then when you also look at kind of the recent history, and you talk about the 2017 draft, everybody talks about, well, they got Tariq Cohen and Eddie Jackson in round four. That's great. But they're getting absolutely nothing out of the first and second round picks from that draft in Trubisky and Adam Shaheen. If you want to sit there and say, well, what about the 2018 draft? Well, how much are they really getting out of that draft class? 2019, how much are they really getting out of that, that draft class? You can say, well, they get a lot out of Roquan Smith and da 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 the 2008 class. Yeah, maybe. Do you want to go there? You know, you could say James Daniels, Anthony Miller. That's one draft class that at least has produced something. But 2019 didn't have a ton outside of David Montgomery, realistically, and certainly doesn't look like it's still going to have much outside of that. 2017 doesn't have a lot. So when you start looking at some of the other tea leaves here in terms of, you know, where you build your teams through the draft and you do well there, the Bears haven't had a ton of picks because they traded away the two first-round picks for Khalil Mack all the while. The results for Ryan Pace, especially in early rounds, has not been good. This is a team that's missed on a 2015, 2016, and 2017 first-round pick in Kevin White, Leonard Floyd, Mitchell Trubisky uh, consecutively. And all of a sudden now people are talking about this is a 10 or 11 win team based off of what? Optimism and hope is one thing, but foolishness is another. And this just feels 
like an exercise in futility to me to give this team reason to believe in them when they don't give you the reasons to believe in them.